Welcome back, everybody. Today, we are going to be exploring one of the biggest stigmas about eating disorders, which is that they're attention seeking, which I actually don't totally disagree with, but obviously, I'm not going to let you down, so stick with the video. <laughs> But before we get into that, Holly and I have been bursting at the seams to share with you that we have our next Beyond Body Retreat planned for August 2025. And we have loved taking our previous guests down to the South Coast because obviously it's such a special place to us. But we actually have another place that is just as special to both of us, and that is Ubud in Bali. So we are booked and ready to take you to Bali for four nights, five days. There is a link in the description box below, which talks you through everything we have in store, three workshops, cooking class, plenty of group time, a celebratory dinner out at a beautiful favorite restaurant of mine called Arcadia. Uh, we have got so many exciting things in store for our guests, all in our own private paradise with its own cafe. It's got two communal pools, ice bath, sauna. I mean, it's unreal. And we also have payment plans available, six or eight month payment plans so that it's super, super manageable and affordable for people. So go and check that out. I'll pop a very pretty promo video in at the end as well so that you can really get a sense of it. Please stick around and watch it, even if you have no interest in coming to the retreat, because I'm really proud of it and I think it's very, very pretty. Um, but yeah, we just, we love doing these. It is such a passion for us uh, to help people find just these incredibly rich, incredible layers of recovery that they might otherwise not get the opportunity to explore. If this stuff was just about food and body, I would have quit this job about five or six years ago. Uh, but let's get into the content of the video, which is the idea that eating disorders are in part or in their totality for some people about attention seeking. There are so many awful aspects of the eating disorder stigma that we all know too well, whether or not it's stereotypes about what eating disorders look like or how they manifest or what the most common eating disorders are. By the way, people who have no knowledge about this stuff always get it wrong. And that means that the stigma is really impactful. So we've always got to be out here challenging this stuff. And then there's all of those other layers of the stigma. The fact that this only affects, you know, young, white, affluent women. And one of those elements is the idea that eating disorders are attention seeking. And as I said at the top of the video, part of this I actually agree with. I do believe that eating disorders are in part about seeking attention for a really deep need for help and support that is then communicated through the eating disorder, through behaviors, through the body. And I wouldn't use the term attention seeking, but when I am kind of challenging somebody who holds these views, that will be my entry point of like, yeah, you're right. They are seeking attention. But when we think of an attention seeker, we think of somebody who is obnoxious or in your face or, you know, just over the top, etc. cetera, uh, and is maybe dishonest, right? Maybe presenting their needs inaccurately or be, or exaggerating, etc. And it is so damaging because it's one of the core reasons that I hear from people uh, about why they don't reach out. A big part of our work as coaches is to help people to recognize and unpack the barriers they have to seeking support. It's why Carolyn has an entire key in the eight keys to recovery from an eating disorder dedicated to help seeking. 95% of the people I work with have an incredibly strong resistance to help seeking. And they all have their completely understandable reasons for why. Their attempts at help seeking before have been met with no response or an abusive response, an invalidating response, uh, with neglect, uh, whether or not it's from parental figures or caregivers or friends or partners, they have been taught repeatedly not to ask for help, not to seek help, not to verbally communicate what their needs are because it's pointless. Nothing going it. That's how I grew up. Don't ask for help. No one's coming. <laughs> and so what we actually see is that people are not fulfilling this stereotype. A lot of people are as a result becoming hyper independent. They are overly independent. This can be a very, very clear reaction to experiences of trauma uh, and no surprise then that it shows up in the eating disorder sufferer population because there's a lot of overlap between trauma and eating disorders developing. So 
the fact that people are given this label of you're an attention seeker with the negative connotation of that is the absolute antithesis to what we see. These are people who are the least likely to shine a spotlight on their needs. These are people who would rather walk across coals than say, um, I don't understand the question. Can you please repeat it? <laughs> there are so many signs of this when I look back on my life that I can see manifesting that one being a great example. My maths teacher would always say to me, Mia, you could be good at this. You just don't ask for help. You need to put your hand up. I would rather have died. The amount of shame and the amount of self-judgment that I would put myself through when I didn't understand something created enormous barriers to me being able to uh, you know, move forward or excel or, you know, even just pass. Because I, other than consumer arithmetic, I got less than 15% in every single exam in year 10. And then I dropped it. No surprise there. Uh, and I, I, ran, I run a business. So it's good that I did well in consumer arithmetic, but it created so many barriers. And then it started to almost metastasize into, I couldn't ask for help for anything. And I couldn't appear to be struggling with anything ever. Again, because the amount of shame I would feel being flawed, being uncertain, had always invited humiliation, had always invited shame, uh, was never encouraged. Uh, and so therefore, I just wouldn't ask for help, even when it became dire, even as my depression developed, my anxiety developed, and then as a result, my eating disorder developed. So when I say that, yes, eating disorders are in part attention seeking, what I mean is behaviorally they can be attention seeking in terms of how we maybe communicate our needs through our behaviors, through our body, through how we interact with these things that the eating disorder focuses on. And do you know what? A lot of it is subconscious. A lot of it is coming from this deeper, wounded, vulnerable part of us that doesn't even know that we're asking for help, doesn't even know that we're trying to communicate our needs in this way that feels safer than verbalizing it and actually looking at somebody and saying, I'm not okay, I need help, I'm lost, I'm anxious, I'm confused, I'm full of self-loathing, I don't trust myself. That feels scarier to many people with eating disorders. This is not, we don't tire everyone with the same brush. In terms of the clients I've seen over eight years, I can see percentages of who this stuff affects in my client work, and it is the majority, but that's not to say it's everybody um, or that it's consistent across other people's experiences, but we know that there's a lot of this out there. It feels scarier to ask for help than it does to subconsciously or consciously communicate it through your body, and it is why we then become so reliant on our eating disorder as our primary communicator. It becomes like a spokesperson. And that's not just with bringing attention to where we need help, but also how we communicate other things, how we communicate in terms of our boundaries. That's the other thing we do a lot of work with clients around is helping them to recognize their barriers to having boundaries, having healthy boundaries in their relationships because they don't feel entitled to it, just as they don't feel entitled to help because of what they've been taught, what they've experienced, what they've absorbed. They don't feel entitled to their space, to saying no, that if somebody wants something from them, we interpret that as they deserve it and I'm obligated to give it, whether that's of our time or our resources or our energy. And so it makes sense then, doesn't it, that through eating disorder behaviors, we're communicating our boundaries, whether to ourselves or to others. Like when you disappear into your eating disorder, when you disappear into your behaviors, when you disappear by literally disappearing, I would just like go dark for a while, right? Because I was alone with my eating disorder. I was alone with my behaviors, with my rituals and my habits, because that was easier and felt safer than saying to somebody, I need time or I need space. I didn't feel entitled to that. I didn't feel deserving or worthy of communicating that. And so my behaviors, my eating disorder became my spokesperson. It, it communicated my needs and it literally created distance and space that if I had recognized that and was able to execute that in a healthy way is fine. Of course, you are entitled to space and time. But when we aren't doing that healthily, we'll find a way. And it's through these maladaptive uh, avenues to coping, right? So when people 
have these stigmatized views of sufferers and of eating disorders, they're a little bit close to it. <laughs> but then we got to fill in all the color and the detail for them, right? There is nothing wrong with wanting to bring attention to the fact that you are suffering. There is nothing wrong with wanting to bring attention to the fact that you need help, whether you're doing it consciously or subconsciously. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, if we think about it, it's actually a real indicator of the fact that your survival instinct is very much connected, that you are in some way trying to signal, I need help. I need someone to see my suffering. I need somebody to intervene. And the thing that we're missing is the thing we were never taught or that we were conditioned out of, which is being able to ask for help, being able to verbalize what we need. And there is, if that is, if, if not being able to ask for help kept you safe at during periods of your life, then you protected yourself, right? I think then when we go through recovery, we can shame ourselves. Like when I start working through help seeking and boundaries with clients, they will really start to shame themselves. Like, why did I ever behave like this? And what, like, it, it wasn't that hard. And well, it was, it was because we don't fall into these things because they're fun. <laughs> we develop them because there is a gap. There is a gap in what we have as far as our caregiving or a traumatic experience or it's, you know, comorbidities. And our brain does its best to fill in that gap. And if it has to do it temporarily with maladaptive stuff, that is still your survival instinct. So if you had to ask for help through these mechanisms for a while, no shame, no shame. It is now about going back and digging that out and filling that gap again with something that's more sturdy and sustainable and that doesn't, you know, also bear all of these really awful consequences that you, you know, obviously have coming along with your eating disorder. Let me know if you feel like that was or is a feature of your eating disorder. It certainly was for me, major spokesperson, eating disorder loved a podium. <laughs> <laughs> it's very authoritarian, my eating disorder. There was no other podium. There were no debates going on for a little while uh, until Healthy Self showed up on the stage. But let me know your thoughts, as always, in the comments below. I'm going to pop in our beautiful promo for our retreat. We'll see you next week with another episode. In the meantime, as always, much love. Take care. See you next week.